training, I would meet with families whose infants suffered from colic. That poorly understood condition where newborns cry inconsolably day and night. These parents were horrible. Overwhelmed, exhausted, unable to comfort their babies, they would plead to me and say, Doctor, why is my baby crying? What's wrong with my baby? And though I wanted nothing more than to be able to provide answers to them, all I could do was assure them that with time, this would pass. Ironically, when I brought my firstborn home, she had such severe colic. We both cried day and night. I felt like a failure. I couldn't help her. I couldn't console her. I couldn't understand her. Why are you crying? Tell me what you need. I had become those parents. This moment would be a key catalyst in my work. My entire career centers upon taking care of newborns. Welcome to my world. My patients can't tell me where it hurts, or what's bothering them, or how they're feeling. They can't say, I feel tired today, or I don't feel like eating. I simply don't know how to eat. Caregivers like me walk to the bedside, look into an incubator, and say, what's wrong with you? Knowing no answer will ever come. We then convince ourselves that we could use our clinical skills to determine what is ailing our patients. That baby is infected. That baby, developmentally delayed. That baby, just tired. However, when we... However, when we look back on all of those predictions, we find out we are wrong the majority of the time. Did you know that over 80% of the babies to whom we prescribe antibiotics aren't infected? We're terrible at predicting long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. To be fair, we are pretty good at predicting who's tired. Since my babies sleep 18 to 20 hours a day, it's a fair bet. The reality is we have very limited tools that can help us assess how our, patient, how our patients are developing and their health status. Traditional means that we could use in older patients, like frequent blood sampling, are unrealistic in these patients. They simply do not have the blood to give. In order to bridge this huge communication gap that I have between these fragile newborns who need clinical assessment and the doctors and nurses that must provide an accurate assessment of them, I needed an epiphany. And then I thought, of course, saliva. <laughs> My love and respect for spit goes back over 25 years. When I was a college undergrad, I would analyze hormones in women's saliva to predict their fertility. I learned very quickly about the diagnostic power of saliva, and I knew it was a window into the body. Although it's composed of over 99% water, Saliva is a rich source of proteins and microbes and genetic material. Changing levels of any of these 
reflect not only what's occurring in your blood, they reflect the health status of your organs, including your brain. Saliva is easy and safe to collect, and we make it all day long. Ancient Chinese medicine teaches that saliva and blood are brothers, and that saliva is the window into the body. However, could it really hold the key and be the breakthrough I needed to better communicate with my patients? Over 10 years ago, my laboratory began to explore the diagnostic potential of neonatal saliva. Specifically, we studied oral feeding skills and oral feeding behavior in newborns. The vast majority of premature babies have no idea how to eat. They simply can't do it. Traditional thinking says that once they're able to coordinate how to suck, swallow, and breathe, he or she will be able to eat. But sometimes a baby will eat a whole bottle at one feed and never, never wake up at the next. Traditional thinking says that that baby was so tired after taking that whole bottle, he just slept through the next feed. But was that right? Was those babies so tired that they forgot to eat? Could saliva help me? To find out, my laboratory began to collect hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of saliva samples from babies who were learning to feed. And we would analyze that saliva and find expected systems like the nervous system and the oral motor system and the GI system that's needed to feed. But we also found signals that were related to feeling hungry. One such marker was known as the neuropeptide Y2 receptor, or NPY2R. NPY2R helps our brain know when our belly is empty or full. Low levels make us feel hungry. High levels make us feel full. My lab would go on to show that if we could detect NPY2R in neonatal saliva, it was 95% accurate in predicting that that baby could not eat. He couldn't feel hunger. And there it was, the epiphany I had been waiting for. Babies eat when they're hungry. <laughs> I know. If ever there was this moment in my career where I thought, I think you should have thought of that sooner. <laughs> it was this moment. These babies didn't not wake up to eat because they were too tired or didn't know how to eat. These babies didn't wake up because they didn't know they were supposed to. Come with me into the neonatal intensive care to see the premature babies. You can hear the silence and feel the frustration of the doctors and nurses trying to understand the patients in their care. If you were born extremely premature, you do not wake or cry to eat. There is no need to feel hungry in the womb. These babies don't cry, but by the time they're ready to go home, they will wake every three hours, scream and demand to be fed, and it was that maturation in part that was separating those babies who could and couldn't eat, and the answer lay in one drop of saliva. So what? Why does it matter if I know why an infant can or can't eat? How does that help me take better care of them? Feeding, it's complicated. 
It's the most complex task of the newborn, and it is their first developmental milestone. In order to successfully feed, a baby must coordinate all their senses, including vision and smell and taste. They have to have a mature nervous and GI system and know how and when to feed simultaneously in order to feed. A disruption in any one of these systems can prohibit a baby from eating. This results in conversations at the bedside between doctors and nurses that sound something like this. Did the baby eat? No, the baby didn't eat. Really? I wonder why. I don't know. Right. Well, maybe the baby will eat tomorrow. Yes, maybe the baby will. By understanding why an infant can't feed, saliva allows me to answer those ridiculous questions. And in turn, I can individualize care plans based on that infant. I can provide physical and occupational therapy to those babies who don't know how to eat. I can ask a mom to hold her baby more who lags in sensory integration. And for those babies who show global delay and will not reach this first milestone, I can have specialists work with these children for the first few years of life in the hopes that they will reach their other milestones, like sitting and walking and talking. Now, I needed another epiphany. If saliva could tell me this much about how premature babies learn to eat, could it help me explain some of the other feeding issues I see in other babies I care for? Let's walk back into the unit. The silence of the premature babies will be broken by those who were born addicted to opioids. Their cries will haunt you. These infants have feeding issues too. For as much as a premature baby struggles to eat, a baby born addicted to opioids never seems to stop eating. In fact, a baby born addicted to narcotics can consume one and a half to two times the calories of a healthy term newborn. Traditional thinking says, well, that excessive eating is due to the fact that they are going through withdrawal. Tremors, agitation, excessive crying all equates to more calories burned, therefore more calories needed. But I question whether that told the whole story. Was it possible that as these babies were weaned off of narcotics, they were overeating in response to that, trading one addiction for another? Could saliva help? Back again we went, collected dozens and dozens of saliva samples, and we got our first objective evidence to support the hypothesis that these babies do not simply overeat because of an increased caloric demand. They are overeating because food has become their drug. These infants have a different relationship with food, and this matters. Because identifying addictive behavior in infancy may predict lifelong addictive behavior. Knowing this information gives us a chance to intervene. This matters because we have got to stop making assumptions about our infant patients and work towards gaining accurate, objective evidence about their health and development. Five or 10 years ago, the thought that we could gain such information seemed unattainable. As such, neonatal salivary diagnostics remains in its infancy. We need large-scale clinical trials to determine the role of saliva in neonatal care, and regulatory bodies must come in and give their approval before our approaches are universally accepted. 
But I have seen firsthand how saliva can impact neonatal care. Therapeutic drug levels, infection risk development, all can be assessed in one drop of saliva in minutes to mere hours. Collecting and analyzing saliva at the bedside will allow me to determine which baby is infected and which isn't. Which baby is at risk for neurodevelopmental delays and which isn't? And which baby can eat and why that baby can't? This depth of information can transform care. Research and my own personal drive to better communicate with my patients has led to breakthroughs that not only change how we assess our infants, it's changed the traditional thinking about them. Research has fueled my mission to finally give these babies a voice. Looking back on those dark early days of parenthood, my husband and I would have appreciated a saliva test that could have predicted that by four months of age, our daughter would stop crying and become this happy, laughing, inquisitive baby girl. I didn't know then about the communicative powers of saliva or from where inspiration would come. As a neonatologist and mother, babies have taught me to think differently about how I approach and care for them. And in so doing, I've had the greatest epiphany of all. These babies, who seemingly have no way to effectively communicate, in fact, have an enormous amount to say. They say it in saliva. Thank you. <laughs>